our second Saturday layout tour, uh, first one of 2024. And this week we have Greg Wright uh, talking about his outdoor uh, layout, F scale, I think it is, or um, anyway, he's been hosting operations sessions, so this should be very interesting. Of course, it's been very cold, as you all know here, so I'm guessing that Greg's not operating it right now. Um, uh, you are correct. But, but our friend Ray and Wheeler he, might, if he is out, fortune snow on his outdoor layout. But <laughs> anyway, so this is a, a good day to be inside uh, for a layout tour. All right, so this is a follow-up to a presentation I did over a year ago about I was building an outdoor railroad. This is, it's gotten built and we've been doing operating sessions. And over the past summer, I was able to op have 10 operating sessions on the outdoor railroad. So we do as a tour of the railroad, we'll touch really briefly on how it was built and then some pictures of operations. And in 2019, this is the corner that I started with. This is was a failed attempt at an outdoor railroad from the late 1980s, early 90s. And it just sat there until I finally got around to doing something. So contrast that to there, uh, basically the same space, but a little bit better construction. And what I wanted to do was raise, raise it up so you weren't constantly bending down and trying to work on trains at your foot at your feet level. So the uh, galvanized sheets make the back, the concrete blocks make the front so I could get some curves in there. And then I filled the whole thing with gravel. And with that done, it looked like that and be ready for planning and track at this point. Um, fence had to be replaced. So a number of things that went on all at once. Turns out having the fence not there while I was putting it together initially worked out in my favor. So I finished up the fence afterwards. I also decided to let it set over winter uh, to see how much settling I would get. And surprisingly, I didn't get a lot of settling. So that's been a good thing. But that's how it looked, you know, at the end of 19 when I was really working on it and starting to put things together. And you'll notice to the far side there is a shed and you'll see how that plays in. And also it has no doors at this point. So by 2021, I actually had a railroad in the backyard. You can see uh, it's now got track. It's got a few plants, a few dead plants. I've not been completely successful on my plants so far. Um, this ends up being about 28 inches uh, is the height here. And most of the railroad sits at that height. I didn't put much grade in uh, except for a couple little spots. And we'll talk about those later. So why my back hurts, there's just three hundred, just under 300 wall blocks in the, all the sections of my railroad and 20 tons of rock, dirt, gravel, stepping stones, wall blocks, and pressure treated lumber. So uh, it, it's a good exercise program along with being a fun railroad program. I have about 100 feet of track from one end to the other um, where there's places where it's double tracked or tracked side by side with sidings. That works out to about 200 feet of total track. I have one yard right in the middle. It's a three track yard, four logging areas. And the only grade is on a long run along a fence, which is less than 2%. 200 feet of track from different manufacturers. I have, because I'm using dead rail, I've mixed plastic, aluminum, brass, steel. It really doesn't matter which kind of track you're using because once you put some spray paint on it, it all looks the same. It all operates the same. Um, and I've had very good luck, even with the plastic, of not having damage. So back on that failed attempt I showed you early on, there was plastic track on there for 20 years. And the only pieces that broke were the ones that I broke when I picked it up. So it's stabilized enough from the ultraviolet plus a layer of paint on it to, ju to do just fine. I'm up to 24 switches. It's amazing how quickly... The switches add up, two engines, 18 log cars, 16 other assorted freight cars. Those numbers keep moving just a little bit. Um, not a lot of buildings. I'm trying to dub just enough buildings to imply what it is we're doing. Buildings, just like inside, take up a lot of room. And very surprisingly, there's not as much room outside as you think there might be when you get started. So we'll follow the line around the yard first, and then we'll come back and see the operations. 
So my garage is kind of sits right here. You come out the door to the garage. Uh, the first thing we'll see is, is a loop called Rainier. Move our way around to Skookum Check. We'll go through the shed. Shed is right here. Uh, Gregory is where the main yard and the mill and the yard, the log dump is. And then you head down 75 feet down a fence all the way. So all of this stuff is, is accessible along that fence. You get a nice long run with your locomotive. So camp two is the first logging camp. Rock camp is a little extra siding where we're getting construction materials. Camp three is the last logging camp that I built. It's, it's the lowest point um, as far as when you have to bend over, but it's not too awful bad. Railroad camp, borrowing from some local railroad names, that's my, my biggest log camp. And there's also some maintenance sidings there and some uh, team track. And then camp four is really just sort of a staging track that was left over, but it works out for operations. So there's a concrete patio on the side of the house. This is Rainier right here. I use reversing loops because it's dead rail. The reversing loops work just fantastic for turning trains and doing everything else. So the existing layouts over here, this is the most recent addition, no track on it yet. And I'll have to build the connection across here, uh, which I'll probably get started in February to do that. That is not the shed for um, the railroad. That's the shed for all the Christmas decorations. That's a whole nother story. So I can't have this be a, a permanent connection. It has to be some sort of a lift span in here. That will take care of that. So Rainier to be developed will have a station and a big loop track. There's you can see a little better the rest of it. So track will run around here, head towards the fence, make a curve, come in here at Skookum. Um, and now you can see the two sheds. This shed is full of trains. Uh, Skookum Loop was part of the original. I was at a layout down in Portland, saw this beautiful loop around this really mature rhododendron, and I thought, I need that. Uh, but I didn't have 25 years to wait. So a whiskey barrel and a fairly big size rhododendron will kind of give me the look. And what it does is it just breaks up the view and lets your trains run around things. And just like indoors, that's really valuable on your outside, the way things look. This brown area right here will be some sort of a covered deck bridge. Um, it just needs some sheeting put over it. Just again, to, to break up the view so you're seeing your train do interesting things as it goes around. Off the back of Skookum Loop is what we call, I called Skookum. So ended up with a track, main track and a siding and found a birdhouse. That's a birdhouse that that looked pretty good, looked to be the right size, so it got a coat of paint. It's not finished by any means, but it creates one of my buildings. And that loop around to Rainier is gonna come off this back track and make its way back here. So there'll be a siding here you can work and plus the work over at Rainier. There's the storage shed that we got built in 2020. Um, really proud of how that turned out. It was a handful. The story on this is I built this side of the storage shed with outdoors, uh, probably back in 15 or 18. And then I decided that it wasn't big enough, so I built this side with outdoors after that. And then once I decided to do the outdoor railroad, I thought, well, this needed engine house doors. What I didn't count on was that this thing wasn't square and they weren't exactly the same size. So figuring out the angles on the doors uh, to make them look the same was a real trick. So I'm pretty pretty pleased with how it came out. If you were down here, I'd show you where the where things don't quite line up. But it looks like an engine house. It feels that way. The tracks run behind two tracks through, plus a siding back there, and then all of the carts that I use, the containers to keep the train through the rest of the year when they're not on the layout, sit right in here. I don't leave the trains out when I'm not operating. We're seeing Gregory Yard. So this is part of that original picture you saw. Gregory Yard is really just a big reversing loop. One reversing loop goes this way and comes back to there. The other reversing loop goes this way and comes back to there. 
So this becomes the hot spot for operations. There's a siding here called mill siding. There's the siding here for the log dump. That's the brow log. And the assumption is that the mill pond and the mill are all right here in this opening open pit. Uh, this is the three track yard and the office or the tall, t tall cedar timber railway. If you notice back here, there's a whole bunch of tall cedars. Those were about three foot tall transplants that were given to me by a, a person in the adjoining neighborhood when I moved into this house in 1988. Now they form a beautiful backdrop to the railroad. Um, funny, just like inside, you've got throttles, paperwork, you gotta have places to put it. So uh, you need to account for those things outside just like you do for the inside. Another view of Gregory, you can start to see some of that. Here's that mill track. Uh, there's a new siding going in right here that will be a team track. That's a, an addition this, this year. There's a little short track here that backs up to the office that can hold a small box car or a tank car. Uh, here's the yard areas. And I don't have a working log loader, although people have tried to encourage me that, but there is a log loader, unloader, a frame here. So as you're unloading logs, you have to make sure your car is lined up appropriately before you hand unload your logs into a bin. And that's how this uh, whole system works. As we continue across this way, we're gonna head up the fence and towards the rest of the layout. One last view of how that all lays out. Looks like there's plenty of room until you get four people trying to all operate in there at the same time. Two crews of two people and five opinions on what should be done. It's a garden railroad, so you have to have some plantings. I toyed with the idea of a tunnel and, and the layouts I've seen where they have tunnel, that's a lot of work for not a lot of uh, return. So basically just created a rock cut out of my rocks and planted it. And it works like a tunnel as far as a view block. Again, the view blocks make things more interesting. So try to create view blocks, whether it's an indoor or outdoor layout. There's the offices and the log dump. You can see some of the log cars there. You can see the A-frame I'm talking about right next to the brow log. What that does is it slows the operators down because they can only unload one at a time. And here's the little switch engine. You'll see some more pictures of that as we move on. There's a whole, there's a whole group of them sitting there. So I have the switch engine and I have a Bachman Climax. That's the whole motive power for this small railroad. Uh, I've got a couple of cabooses, a little shorty here that goes out with the switcher and this logging caboose that has a little bit of room for the crew and then assorted other cars uh, throughout there. Barrels of beer here because we got to have beer if we have loggers and a water spout that sits here that's just some PVC pipe stuck into the ground. As far as my track, I ballast it all and then I put just a light layer of cement on it and then let the water make that cement crusty. And that's how I mount things like this tree or this uh, water spout and this and the idea behind the crusty is that I can use a leaf blower to clean this thing off without blowing my ballast everywhere. Twin bridges. Uh, this is a piece that I built really early on and it lifts up so I can get to the back of my yard, especially in winter. There's a whole nother section of yard back here where I store stuff. So this bridge lifts out. Um, it's also two sides of that big reversing loop. So you, there's no crossover. You've got to go all the way around camp two over here or back to Gregory, the main switch to move from place to place. Um, pieces and parts I collected over the year. There's a Bachman bridge there. There's some Aristocraft trussel vents there. There's some Bachman parts. Um, finding outdoor, you can mix and match pretty effectively. Here's camp two. So Gregory is over here. You come out and you service camp two. Uh, there's a siding here that'll hold four of the log cars. Uh, if they're short or three of the long log cars, a little bit more of a loader uh, jib here. I didn't do anything with it other than find a couple pieces of blow down trees from my yard and find the straightest pieces and put them all together with some cable. But you get the impression of where you are working 
and then there needs to be an office there for camp two and a storage shed. So that's putting that together. And you can kind of see now, this section is not quite as high. It's three blocks high. So each place is a little bit different on how much you have to bend over, but I tried to keep that bending over to a minimum. There's a close up of camp two without the buildings in there. I used, for this one, I had a big planter, plastic planter that I set behind uh, or set inside the frame and then filled gravel all around it and put soil in the planter and lined it with rocks. That's how I get my planting area here. Back over at Gregory, I built the planting areas in with filled, marked them out with rocks, finished the gravel and put soil in them. So I have very defined planting areas. I didn't want plants everywhere. I'm starting to add a few more things like sedums that will grow with almost no soil. Um, these are cutoffs again from things that fall out of my tree, cedar trees. You take them with a small chainsaw and you put a nick on each side about a, you know, a quarter of the way in. And then you smack it with a sledgehammer and it breaks beautifully just like it was cut in the woods. And then you stick the stump into the ground and it looks like you've been logging here. In 2022, the back fence was replaced and I was able to hang track on it to reach the other end of my backyard. So there's 70 feet of track hanging on the fence. We'll see how that works out. As part of that, I was able to put in this little siding um, for rock camp and there was a pear tree here and Brian Ferris was telling me a story about an apple tree that supposedly was down by Vancouver as you're coming in from Camas was a very notable point on the BN down there and I thought well why not my pear tree's here it's dead this ended becoming pear tree bridge and this is a, a pretty busy little interchange here you got to be careful as you're creeping across from the uh, original layout to the new part of the layout here and through this switch area. Rock camp is a place to put some rock cars that I've got for maintenance trains. They're heading on, they can go anywhere on the layout. You can see the, the track here. Um, I know that's metal track. I think that's plastic track. And by painting it with some grays and some browns, some rust colors and some wood colors, you know, it all blends in, you can't tell. Some of the joints are uh, epoxied together. Some of them have rail joiners, some of them have both. Um, with enough paint, it starts to disappear. There's where Pear Tree, here's Camp Two Loop. Pear Tree Bridge comes across and connects to the back. Um, I want people to go slow here. So I, I found a cast metal speed limit sign uh, on eBay. It was way too big, but it was simple enough to find from Etsy the same kind of materials. That's a piece of rounded MDF with a ring that they provided, plus some stick on or some wooden letters, all painted up and weathered. And all of a sudden, you have a cast iron speed limit sign that can remind your operators not to go too fast through here. Uh, the the worst thing about the railroad is if the engine falls from the elevated track and the op and the owner starts to cry. I really frown on that. It's embarrassing. I try not to have that happen very often. Here's Camp Three. It was added in 2023. A very narrow, um, long camp. All my other camps have reverse loops. This one has has an actual passing siding, so you get a different type of operation here. Logs come down in here. Here's a team track for supplies and the passing siding is back here. So you have to do lots of running back and forth to get around your train on this one. This one's about a foot off the ground. So it's, it's a little bit lower, uh, still not too bad to reach. And then here's that run along the fence, 70 feet along the fence. So when you're running your train, you're walking along here, you're about eight feet from your train as it, as it teeters its way along here and it, uh, kind of creaks and groans and leans as it goes. Here you can see more of it. I'm using a lot of Alberta spruce, dwarf Alberta spruce. Um, this one's planted right in here. This one's still in its uh, in its potting container as it came from the nursery. And Alberta spruce will go for a very long time in those containers and not grow very big. 
Now there's a train running along the fence. Um, one of the things you get on the outside is some really cool shadows that makes for interesting viewing of your train, sometimes not the best pictures, um, but you'll see that. So this train is bringing a load of logs from up in here, camp three or camp four, down towards Gregory. Because it's a climax, um, I don't care if it's running uh, water car front or the front of it front, it doesn't matter. It just runs that way. It runs the same front, forwards or backwards, just fine. On this one, the, the little water car I've got here holds the battery pack and the receiver, the front part of it. The speaker is here, and uh, otherwise, it's a stock Bachman locomotive, just did a lot of weathering on it. There's the <clears throat> loading spur at Camp 3. It's gotten a little bit more detail. I now have a building there, another one of those sawed-off logs, a shed that's left over. So you have an idea, just enough idea to where you can figure out where I want you to place things. And I've got labels on, on things that say what camp it is. So once you get there, you kind of have an idea what's going on. Continue on the fence one. Now we're heading out with that. We picked up that rock train and uh, some ties and a tool car, and we're heading out to camp three. This is that actually a little bit less than 2% grade I'm talking about as you head towards the other end of the yard. Making the transition now, we've come off the fence and we're gonna move out into the yard where I built another raised area called railroad camp and another big reversing loop quite a few tracks here to work with. There you can see, this is the railroad camp reversing loop. It goes around here, around the back. Another one of the raised um, plastic flower pot, great big flower basins here, filled with soil so I can have some plants. Uh, a few more buildings. This is one of the places you pick up log cars, uh, an extra storage track, uh, saw a spur track here to deal with which has some industry on it. This is where Camp 3's would have, or excuse me, where railroad camp would do their maintenance work. And by running all the way around here, you can reverse your train's direction and then use this as trailing points instead of facing points. The thing you have to remember in operations, if you need to work this spur, you need to do it first, then make your loop around the back and then work this in. A little more you can see. I've got one really long flat car. It does a couple things. It messes up operations because it's not the same size as anything else. So you got to account for that. Um, it will eventually have four trucks under it. It'll be my heavy duty flat. Just makes for a little bit more interest. Here's log cars waiting to be pulled out. Here's empties waited to come, waiting to come in. And got to figure out how to get the locomotive around all of this. The other thing is, because of the tight radius, I've got Talgo couplers, and you can't push more than four cars around a corner. So you got to be really careful and think through your switching loops. There's the log cars waiting. Some more, some more logs that fell out of the sky. Decided to use as scenery. The other thing that happens is when I built along the fence, I put these two by fours to span the distance just like the fence runners and then laid the track on top so I left ended up having three feet of two by four here because I needed to split off and head up over to railroad camp so why not extend that another eight feet put some track on it and that is now camp four staging so a train starts here partway through operations the one train gets backed into here so it just can't let a good bit of space go to waste you got to put track everywhere you can um, I found this online about the, the knowledge base and where you are with beginner and where you are as you become an expert. And I thought, well, I've been building model railroads for 40 years. This should be pretty good. I know what I'm going to be doing. I ought to be up in here somewhere. And I found that wasn't the case. I had some knowledge of building railroads, but when you start doing it outside, the comprehension is a little bit different. And then when you put it together, the application is really different. So got to deal with things like weather. You have to deal with frost heave or things moving. Mostly the wood has been moving. And so it takes a little bit of analysis and synthesis. 
And then you try it and you have another operating session and you see what worked and you see what didn't. But it's been a much more interesting and longer learning curve than I ever expected. One of the things I found is that handrails matter. Uh, not so much inside, but outside when you got people going downstairs or stepping over retaining walls, it's nice to give them a handrail um, to hang on as they go. And so one of the things that I learned about working outside that's a little bit different, uh, not hard to do. I mean, it's just a fence post into the concrete with a little bit of handrail, a little bit of paint, but it makes all the difference in the world for the operator. So let's switch to operations. Let's operations in the shade, and you'll see why that's important when it gets really hot. You see how shady it can be back here and pretty nice. Uh, unfortunately, my my local crews always come up with good names. So instead of operations in the shade, it became the Shady Run Railroad for more than one reason, most likely. I've got paperwork that's pretty similar to indoors. Uh, it tells you to run extra from Gregory to Rock Camp, to Railroad Camp, back to Gregory, continue past Gregory to Skookum Chuck and return to Gregory. So that tells you where you're gonna run. And this tells you what car. So there's a tool car at Gregory. You're gonna pick that up. And you're gonna drop it, up, drop it off at Railroad Camp House Track. So you just follow through your paperwork, um, excuse me, just like you would with a switch list. And that will help you uh, to know where to put the different different cars and what to pick up where. Notice that not a lot of stuff has numbers on it yet. So it's still defined by the type of car. I haven't finished my numbering yet. Haven't finished all my weathering yet. That's on my to-do list. But uh, the tool car is labeled on the side. It says tool car, that's pretty easy. The rail and tie car, you can see the rail, you can see the tie. So it starts to make sense after you've been there for a few minutes. Uh, I will eventually get all of the numbers in. But this is the paperwork. So instead of car cards, you get this sort of a switch list and orders all on combined on one sheet. Small enough to carry around stuff in your pocket and provide a clipboard if you want, but that's how you know where things are supposed to go. So here's uh, a couple of operators working Gregory Mill. This was probably July. Beautiful sunny afternoon. Here's those nice tall, tall cedars that provide really good shade through here. Really nice when the temperature is about 100 degrees outside. We did operate one day when it was really hot. Still pretty comfortable. On an 80 degree afternoon, it's just beautiful out here. Put some lawn chairs over here on the patio, have a cooler, and looks like some goodies showed up, and away we go. I think it was Robin that brought the hat because he figured he'd be out in the sun all day and found out really quickly that it's a shady run railroad. You can see Gregory, they're working there. There's that twin bridges I was talking about. Camp three and four and railroad camper this way and Rainier and Skookum Looper that way. Here's uh, Skookum switching at Skookum before the uh, rhododendron showed up. So you've got to come around here work this siding and try to never push more than four cars around this corner, which makes for a little bit of interest. Um, use this old passenger car as an office here at Skookum. Again, not to put a lot of buildings on, but just give you an idea of you know, where to stop, where to, where to put things in. You know, there's a person standing there, it helps provide scale. Lee mentioned that this was one to 20.3 scale. Um, F scale, it's called. I, I've been a little bit loose on the scale. It doesn't seem to be quite as important outside. I do try to keep all my cars, you know, the same. So all my box cars are are the Bachman size, which is one to twenty point three. Some of the things you see in the outdoor railroads is a mixture of scales, and I try to stay away from that. Log cars. It's pretty tough to pick out what scale a log car is, so you can mix and match, um, but your house cars especially have to be careful with. So I'm technically this would be one to 20.3, three foot narrow gauge. Um, I'm modeling an area that's really not about 10 miles from my house to the southeast, uh, and there was actual logging that went on there. It just wasn't narrow gauge. 
Um, here's a brain trust with two trains at Gregory. So as I was saying before, <clears throat> you have two person crews with two trains and everything happens here at Gregory. So the log train comes in and you need to get the loaded logs off and give them the empties and four operators, which means there's at least five opinions on how it should work until they figure out that one conductor needs to be in charge, the other conductor needs to not be in charge, and the engineers need to do what they're supposed to do. And that's run the train forward or backwards, as we were told last night in our clinic by some prototype engineers. So here's maybe this crew can do a little better. Uh, these guys had it figured out that only one person should be in charge of uh, of what's happening there. And that was, uh, that was uh, Rye Bates. He's got the paperwork there. He's got the uncoupling wand. So think about your uncoupling skewers that you use in small scale and add two feet to it. And that's what we use for uncouplers. Engineer, engineer, and the other conductor. And the other conductor is doing his job of just uncoupling back here, not trying to decide what should happen. It's amazing how much better things will work when there's only a couple bosses instead of four. Here's working camp three. I said this one's a little bit uh, lower to the ground. You see what's happening here is they're doing a runaround move train that they brought in. Now they're running around it. They're going to shove the empties into this track over here. You can just barely see it. They're going to pull the loads out onto the this. I guess that's the main line. This is the runaround. And that reefer needs to get pushed down here to the to the team track. So they're going to be a little while working this out because that's about 12 feet from here to here, a little bit farther, about 15 of the rest of the way. So if you're going to uncouple at both ends, you actually get to do a little bit of walking back and forth. Don't mess a car and, and Jim Elder. I should have identified, let's see, Steve Shores, uh, Bob Kenworthy, Rye Bates, and Scott Gibson working that crew. Uh, Dan Annis is one of the newer local guys working with Brian that day. Bill Messicar and Don Hubbard. Uh, with 10 operating sessions over the summer, I've had a good number of people come down and help me out, which I really appreciated. Um, here's Railroad Camp, trying to figure out that puzzle. That's uh, uh, Scott Skoll and, oh, I can't remember his name right now. It'll come to me. Um, they're working Railroad Camp, that big loop. Here's where I was talking about the shadows. The shadows are kind of cool when you're operating in here and watching your trains run through them. They don't do so well for picture taking. So I got some more pictures of railroad camp and, and we'll see those in a minute. There's a little bit better picture. That's Steve Carter working railroad camp. He's got his train right in the middle of everything. So he's gonna have to do a little figuring. I think he's working on dropping this off and then he's gonna pull his empty logs around here cut loose, come around and pick up the other logs. He's also got to move this rock train down to camp four. So he's going to be here a while working in the shade on this far end of the layout. He's about 75 feet away from Gregory uh, where the switcher down there should be unloading log cars and awaiting his return. What happens though, is when the switcher work gets done, that crew ends up walking up and grabbing a chair on the patio or under the, under the, cover on the deck and kibitzing about how Steve should be doing it. So it gets to be pretty entertaining watching that happen. Here's Jim Yonkins. He's got that log train or he's got that maintenance away train that came out of camp three. He's going to pull it down and then back it into camp four here, tie it down. He's going to move his way back up here and pick up some more cars and then eventually head down the hill with loaded log cars for the mill at Gregory. There he's highballing to the log dump, highballing with a climax has a whole different meaning. It's about as fast as you can walk. Um, and it's a nice little walk along on a patty on the sidewalk to make sure that uh, you get down there with your train and don't go too fast down at Pear, Pear Creek Bridge, Pear Tree Bridge. Here's that back patio I was talking about. So you can sit here in the even nicer lawn chairs and you can watch what's going on, or you can just pay attention to the scenery, watch the birds. Um, makes for a very nice outdoor setting. There's with a little bit more, you can see the uh, 
the scenery here that the train is running behind. Get an idea. There's a little bird bath here. I usually take the water out of this bird bath and remind the operators not to put their paperwork here. It's not a shelf for their paperwork, um, but I'd rather have them put the paperwork than the throttle in there. So, so far, no disasters. But you see what, what you're working in, you're working under the trees in the shade, makes for a, a nice afternoon. Um, don't hit your head on the wind chime here. Everybody will know it. Most people are going to find this place as a good place to sit when they're having a snack and waiting for a turn to run their train. Every outdoor railroad I've seen has a water feature. So mine is, is no exception. Unfortunately, mine's real small and it's not in, integrated right within the track, but you still get the sound of the running water. You get the outdoor sounds um, of the birds and a little bit of traffic going by, but not too much makes for a, a nice afternoon. Uh, the joy of outdoor trains. Here's an 80 degree day in the shade. It's beautiful. We've done uh, one day that was about 99 degrees, uh, even in the shade. It wasn't as beautiful, but it was still uh, a very nice time. Mostly it's, you know, I don't operate in the bad weather, so I try to pick my dates that way, um, make it for a nice afternoon. The sun sets over in here, so you never have the sun beating down in your eyes when you're operating. You just have a, a nice walk, pay attention to the stairs, and back and forth you go. Makes for a, a really nice time, even if it's a little hot. Um, dormant season did come to the Tall Cedar Timber Railroad. The leaves came falling off. A lot of my shade comes from a great big maple tree that sits back here on the neighbor's yard. Um, makes for a beautiful summer. I have to clean up the leaves in the winter. I've cleaned all the leaves in this part, hadn't got to the layout itself. I try to only clean the layout one time because every time you're in here using a rake or whatever to get the leaves off, there's some chance of damage. So I try to be careful about that. But that's what it looks like in the dormant. And by next spring, I have this all cleaned off, have everything spruced up and be running again. Uh, here's where it looks like today. Uh, because I cared so much about this presentation, I ran out really quick in the 22 degree weather and took this picture. Uh, I'm not running trains in this weather. I'm a fair weather railroader. Looks nice. Ray Wheeler can and can enjoy running outside. I'm not doing that yet. This is that spot where uh, Twin Bridges goes and it picks out of there as one big unit. It's hollow, basically made out of pressure treated plywood and it gets stored in the shed so I can get to the rest of the yard during the winter. Still more to do. So I have to bridge to the new reversing loop at Rainier. <clears throat> I have to widen and re-level and reinforce the ledge along the fence. It's two two by fours on end wide with a piece of one by in between them, which is plenty big for holding up the rail, the ties, but I'm gonna add a third line, a third piece of two by four there just to have a little something to catch the train if it does decide to come off um, and to level things out. The pressure treated wood is still moving even though it's a couple years old. So I have to do some re-leveling. I haven't seen a lot of frost heave problems. This is the coldest weather right now that I think this railroad will have experienced. So I will have to see what happens next spring as far as frost heave. Add some additional curved board the outside of the elevated curve sections, again, trying to catch that locomotive just long enough for the operator to step in and grab it. Weather, paint, and letter everything. I haven't got everything weathered the way I want it yet. Be more comfortable with fine scale detail, outdoor survivability and operations. So as you know, on indoor railroads, when you're operating, things get damaged a little bit. So you have to be a little more careful with your details and your level of details and make sure they're well fastened down. Uh, even more so outdoors and I'm, I've not quite found my happy medium yet. It's evolved to kit bashing. I don't have anything that's been putting more and more kit bashings you'll see from with that. My buildings are are rugged. They're just 
plastic Tola or some other brand that's made for being outdoors. Haven't done a lot of modifications to them so that they hold up well. I could leave them out if I wanted to. And more plants. Um, each year at Christmas, Fred Meyer sells Dwarf Alberta spruce for Christmas decorations for $10 or $11 a piece. So each year I grab a few more and replace the ones that have died and, and fill in new areas because it's a logging layout and it's a pretty cheap way to put your trees out there. Uh, more to do is finish the switcher. So this switcher is my latest project. Um, I was going to add a switcher to run the yard and I happened to see this picture. This is from a railroad up in Alaska called the Yakutat and Southern. And what amazed me is it looked like they grafted a boxcar onto the back of a switcher. So I was able to find uh, a 242 switcher. This is an 042, that's easy enough to take care of. So I, I got the switcher, uh, I shortened the front end, I shortened the firebox, and I grafted a boxcar onto the back end. And I was working on this and was getting to be June and the thought was, well, I could continue to do the superstructure work or I could start running outdoors. And I opted to run outdoors. Turned out to be a really good decision. Um, I put just a quick piece of plastic over the back here to cover up this hole. And I found a whole bunch of things out about how to make this thing operate better. So how to do the couplers, um, what to do because this short wheelbase has issues when it goes, when it rises and falls, if the track isn't level. So the operation of it 10 times or more this past summer was a, was really worked out well. And now I can come back and do the superstructure and you'll see. The reason that this picture got my attention was it's a perfect place for the battery and the receiver and the speaker. I wasn't sure where I was going to put it. So Right there, you can just see the top of the speaker enclosure with the speaker facing forward. And right in front of that is the, the board for the, the receiver system, about the size of a pack of cigarettes is the receiver system. And then the battery is sitting here and then brought the wires forward and tied into the original wiring. This is a, a handheld system, uses lithium ion batteries, I've run for over four hours outside without a change and without having a problem with the batteries. The battery pack is about the, as big as the fingers on your hand. Um, there's four or five batteries side by side, and it's providing all the power that I've, I've needed. So I took this picture, um, figured this is it. I looked and searched, could not find another, another view of this locomotive anywhere. So I started doing some work. I figured this guy was between five and five foot six tall. And so I drew an orange line on there with the drawing program. <laughs> then I repeated that same length line to kind of figure out what the wheelbase was, what the total length of the locomotive was, how high to the top of the stack, and then translated that information onto this model. I did not change the running gear other than take out the front, uh, the lead truck, Everything else has stayed basically the same. And I set the length more to how much room I needed for the speaker, receiver, and battery than to be exact here. But I think I came up pretty close. You get the idea. The cab's a little bit different, but I did some things on that to try to make it look right. And the very intricate roof system that ran all the way through. So I worked on that. You'll see that here in the next picture. So after doing all the superstructure work, um, I was here. You can see I added some areas up front. I needed to put weight up front, so that helps hide some of that weight. I shortened the smoke box, changed the, the uh, stack here. From looking at the picture, this is a sand dome and the sand lines. Um, so put that, cut the top of the dome that was there off and changed it to look more like the model. This has been a mystery. We think that maybe it's a siphon line and had a connection back here. And in the picture at this fitting here, the pipe gets bigger. I don't know if that's because that's the pipe they had on hand or just exactly what it was. And then it curves at a slight angle up and goes in the side of the water hatch. So recreated that here. Um, since I don't have a picture of the other side, I 
don't know if it had one on each side. It could have been a pipe to the injectors, but it seemed to go past where the injectors would probably be. So we think it's a siphon only on one side. So that's what I did. I also noticed that the tank had a little flare at the bottom. So using evergreen styrene, I was able to create that flare here. You can see that uh, better from some other views when it's painted up. There was this funky little thing nailed over the top of the door to shield the keep the rain off the engineer and the fireman. So added that. There's the new trailing truck. One of the steps wasn't there when I got the model off of eBay. So it's got a new step. Basically just built what I saw, put it all together. And here we are after weathering. So this section was wood, this section was metal. Uh, this got a, a dark brown and then weathered back with um, some mineral paint, it's called. It's a craft paint that's dead flat. I paint it on, it's thick, and then I scrub it with a toothbrush. And that mineral paint uh, does a fantastic job of settling into just the cracks and creating this weird looking texture and color variations all with the toothbrush. Let it dry, you can come back and redo it. So that's how I weathered that, plus a little bit of, of a um, alcohol-based stain that I used that was called driftwood. And that's how I get the colors here. This is named for my granddaughter, Ella, who was born right when I was buying this. Her first birthday is coming up, so it's called Ella. Doesn't have a number on it. Typical early on with the locomotives that they would have a name on them, so I figured that would work. Here's the locomotive end of it, the boiler. Um, I used a slightly different color, more metallic for the firebox and the smoke box and the stack, and more of a straight flat black for the running gear and the tank itself. Or you can see that flare a little bit now. And then instead of the, the driftwood alcohol stain and pigment, I used a rust alcohol stain and pigment. And it's interesting product. They tell you to put it on thick at the bottom and then invert your model and let it run upwards. And it gets you this nice running texture like it, like it was rain that hit the hair and it started to rust and it collected downwards. Um, sounds backwards, but it gives a pretty nice effect. And then you can adjust the colors a little bit. You can mix the colors. Um, I did swap the photo here so it just lined up right. There's not a pipe really on this side. I just did the photo, um, flopped it over so it would line up with the back end here. So that's where we are right now. I've got just a little bit more work to do. Next weekend up at Puyallup, the Puget Sound Garden Railway Group has their modular layout and I'm part of the Puget Sound Garden Railway Group. So I'll be up there and this should be running uh, around the layout and we'll find out how long that battery really lasts. That's the end. Um, this is the, the band that goes out and performs for the loggers. That would be Rye Bates. He's playing the washboard. Clint Brown, one of the, another one of the local guys is playing the guitar and Brian Ferris on the banjo. So this is a lot of fun. Uh, this is the Christmas card for the tall cedar timber railway. And that's the end of my presentation. Wow, Greg, what a amazing layout and journey that was very interesting so uh, thank you so much and we'll open the floor up now to questions if um, people have questions about how this was built or how it operates or anything well not hearing a question yet i'll i'll start yeah um, okay I, I was wondering, I saw the bird feeders and the bird bath, and I know um, we feed birds at our house. So my question maybe is a, could be an obvious one if you're around this sort of thing. Do you have problems with squirrels on your layout, digging things up, burying <laughs> things, or various nefarious things that squirrels seem to come up with? So, yeah, the squirrels and I have a love-hate relationship. They love my bird seed, and I hate them. Um, they bother my bird feeders. They dump my bird feeders out. They run up and down the railroad, but I haven't seen any problems on the railroad caused by the, by the squirrels. Uh, they love to run down the track. 
um, but they haven't really caused a problem. They don't like to dig in the gravel, and the gravel makes up all of the raised beds. So I think that's probably why I don't have too much trouble with them. But if that changes, there'll be more squirrel hunting going on in the backyard. <laughs> um, I had a question. Do you, can you say a little more about the mineral paint? Does that come in various colors? I hadn't heard of it before. Yeah, and I'm not sure if it's really mineral or not, or that's just their, their clever marketing. But it's, it's a craft paint that I found. It is dead flat, and it had a multitude of colors that were earthy colors. Um, it was a little thicker than maybe the apple barrel paint, which was fine for what I was doing, but you could easily thin it down. It's, it's a latex water-based paint. Um, it comes in, I think they're like pint containers, and they look, they look really good. So scenery-wise, I think they would work really well for any scale. I, you may have a little more trouble with it trying to use it on smaller scale um, on your models, but I think it, you'd have to experiment with it and see how well it, it uh, brushes, uh, how thin you can brush it, or if you could spray it. I'm guessing you could. It's just like any other paint that way. Other questions people might have? Maybe you're all too cold to ask questions these days. <laughs> I, I will certainly reinforce Greg's comment about operating. It's really, uh, it looks simple, but it's really complex. There's a, <clears throat> the way he's got it set up, there's a lot of interaction between the crews. There's timing issues and so on, but he's worked it. It's really a fun, um, physically fun and mentally challenging. Uh, really enjoyed my times there operating. Yeah, thanks, Bill. And, and just, you know, the camaraderie of sitting out in the backyard after it's over or, you know, taking a break. Um, you, you got a very big crew lounge and it, it was very comfortable. So a question about operation. Uh, I just wondered this and maybe the complexity uh, means you don't have to do this, but I was wondering during a session, do you, um, load and reload logs do you move logs from one car to another or or do they stay on the cars that which are loaded when you begin your session and you don't have to do that no all the cars are loaded at the beginning and when they make their way down to gregory to the log dump there the operator there the two guys that are working gregory they put them in a bin for me mm -hmm. and then i move them and then in the empty cars head back out to the camps. And while they're doing that, I will move the logs back out to the camps so that now the next train comes up, has a different load of logs to bring in. And they're hollow plastic. They're, they're as light as a feather. Um, I've got you know, enough for all the cars at once and several different sizes. And so you get a variety of loads. Uh, to look at as you're going and i've got short skeleton cars and long flat cars and you get just a variety of things coming down the hill at you if you're working the camp there if you're working the mill at gregory i don't i haven't made rules that you have to have a certain type of log car at a certain log camp yet I'm not sure that that would really add anything to the operation that's there's plenty to do and again it's you're working exactly like an indoor layout you're looking at car paperwork you're uncoupling but you're doing it outside and it's just a whole different feel uh, when you're bending over with that two foot long coupler pick to uncouple your cars and and uh it's like oh no then then your operator and then your engineer accidentally backs up instead of goes forward and recouples it and you got to do it again <laughs> it, it makes for an interesting time bill's laughing yeah i said that happened once or twice <laughs> <laughs> Greg, when you were building, did you building this? Did you put drains underneath, or is it just drain into the yard? Or how do you handle water that lands on the layout? I know you you mentioned gravel, which is probably a genius move with respect to frost heat. But then, the, do you drain beneath the gravel as well? Yeah, my my big sections of gravel all have uh, the bottom layer is basically the dirt that was there. And I formed it into kind of a bowl, put plastic on it, put a drain line in, and took the drains out the back. So they all have drains in them, so they don't have to deal with that issue. 
except for the, the one at Rainier, which is only a few inches thick. Um, it drains right into the existing ground. That's that sounds smart because what is the old expression? Water always wins, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wanted to try to try to deal with that ahead of time. And and I think I haven't seen any problem with it. And I've seen water coming out my drain pipe, so I know they're working. There's also didn't talk about it, but there's there's uh, in-ground sprinklers around that do most of the watering, including some spray heads up that were built up into the different uh, raised beds so that my watering is take, mostly taken care of. I was wondering, I'm not as familiar with the dead rail um, concept, but um, you've got um, obviously dead rail, you have battery, um, you've got radio control. Where is the radio um, transceiver? Is that in your shed? Uh, or do you just bring it out when you operate? Or what, how does that work with uh, communication between the throttles and the locomotive? You have a handheld throttle, um, about the same size as an iPhone, but as thick as a pack of cigarettes again, about you know about an inch thick, and it talks directly to the locomotive. Hmm. Doesn't do, do anything else, and you uh, you you specify what locomotive it's going to work on, and it works to that one only. You can swap back and forth. The outdoor railroader guys you know, have kind of pioneered that system. They've had it for a long time because they could have bigger batteries. Now the batteries are getting smaller. So the handhelds that I have will operate multiple locomotives if you program them in, since that's real popular in the outdoor group that like to run trains around and around as many as they can. For me, I just programmed one locomotive into each handheld. That way nobody's interfering with each other. And, you know, I've only got two locomotives, so it makes it pretty easy. And same battery nice pack, both locomotives. And the batteries are the same battery pack for both locomotives. And there's a plug hidden on the locomotive so you don't pull the battery packs out. You you charge them right in the locomotive. I have a question. I talked over. Uh, sorry. Uh, I have a question regarding a, a recharging. Do you have to take the batteries out to recharge them, or can you plug a charger into the locomotive for? How does that work? Yeah, there's a, there's a jack hidden on the locomotive and a three position switch, and uh, throw the switch to the to align to actually take the power from the jack to the battery itself, and that isolates the rest of the electronics. So when I come in at the end of the day, um, throw that on the charger, charge it up. the The battery pack never leaves the locomotive. And that climax I've got with the battery car behind is permanently coupled well we are at the 11 o'clock hour so there are no more questions I give uh, greg a big hand virtually here and thank you very much for uh, an awesome <laughs> presentation i'm i'm looking forward to coming down and, and operating now it looks like a lot of fun thank you very much greg you bet